Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Publishing in Experimental Results, a Life Science and Biomedicine Perspective. Today, we'll be talking about our new journal, Experimental Results, with a panel discussion, and I'll introduce you to our panelists shortly, followed by a Q&A. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few items so you know how to participate in today's event. You have all joined in listen-only mode, which means you'll be able to hear us, but not able to speak to us. However, you will have an op the opportunity to submit chat questions by typing your questions into the questions pane of the control panel. You may send in your questions at any time during the webinar. We'll collect these and address them during the Q&A session at the end of today's webinar. If we're unable to get through all the questions during the sessions, they will be included in the Q&A document that will be sent with the recording after the webinar. Should you experience any technical difficulties, please add this to the questions box and a member of the organising team will endeavour to help you. In the unlikely event we experience any issues, we will message the audience and restart the webinar. So to summarise, you'll get a recording of the webinar in the next two days. You can submit your questions at any time and you'll also receive a survey at the end to know how useful you found it and another opportunity to ask any questions. So, introducing our panellists, we have Dr. Fiona Hutton, who is our executive, our executive publisher and head of STEM for Open Access Publishing, Alison Paskins, our publishing editor here at Cambridge University Press, we are also joined with Dr. Michael Nevels, a professor at university, sorry, chief editor for life science and biomedicine, and Professor Martin Michaelis, experimental results review and editor and author. To start, I'd like to hand over to Fiona. Sorry, Fiona, um, if you don't mind to unmute yourself, you're currently muted. Hello, Fiona, oh, sorry. Hi there, apologies for that, that was unmuted. Uh, anyway, the first thing that I wanted to say is a very warm welcome to the seminar. Um, I just wanted to point out that if you want to get in touch with me or anyone else on this panel, uh, please feel free to do so. Um, my details are on the slides. Um, and I, I just wanted to um, say thank you very much for attending. Next slide, please. So as a, a university publisher, what we have a responsibility to think about actually the journey of the research community and what researchers do in their daily life. And, you know, I, th I think this is really important to understand why we actually um, launched the journal Experimental Results. So I thought I'd, I'd just guide you through that. And this is from also from my own personal experience. So, um, and I'm sure some of you out there that are researchers will really identify with that. Some of you might be um, amazing researchers and might, might not, but this is this is my experience and some of uh, other people's experience I know. So you start out, you, you absolutely love science. Um, you know, you go on to do science and um, you become a, a really good researcher. Um, can you forward, Moira? Um, and forward again. You you do lots of experiments. You get an awful lot of unexpected results. Um, your lab notebook is full of this this stuff. Some of it you manage to put together, and it can go into a research paper. But there's an awful lot of experiments that are either standalone that you didn't follow through on that you know took you down a different path and you changed direction. 
um, or just don't make sense. So you can't put them together uh, to form a particular narrative that is, is generally the, the sort of standard traditional narrative that goes into a research paper. So with a research paper, for instance, you would maybe have six experiments that, that get you to towards a particular conclusion. But actually, in most people's um, experimental research, their their lab notebook is full of uh, experiments that, that don't end up in that, that manner. Some of those experiments are actually completely valid experiments and would actually um, be useful to other people in the field. Um, but a lot of the, those experiments may not be. What, what problem does this cause? This causes researchers to feel like a bit of a failure. Not, you know, they do they spend an awful lot of time doing all of this research um, and it doesn't go towards a research paper and that's what you're judged on. Next slide, please, Myra. So why do you do science? You know, people do science, they want to push forward knowledge. Um, we ask quite a number of people, some people want to solve climate change and ensure the world is sustainable. They're excited by new discoveries, they're curious, they want to solve problems, they want to cure a particular disease because it affects their particular family. All of these reasons are why people get involved in science and become researchers. But the problem is, you know, as you go through the research um, uh, culture, um, the most important thing is to, to get your research published and, and get it published in a, a really top journal. But, but they don't start out with that, that premise. They don't start out with, I wanna do science to get published in a, a journal and, and win a prize. That's not, that's not the initial motivation, right? Uh, next slide, please, Myra. But um, they feel a failure because the research hasn't led to these amazing discoveries. Um, so the f they feel like a failure because the reward is for the, you know, the first person to report a finding over those who also report that finding. Those that report positive results that, that look like they're taking the field forward rather than saying, actually, this is not the direction uh, of that particular field. Um, results that fit into a narrative required of a research paper. Next slide, please, Myra. So what happens to the research findings? Um, they're mostly hidden. They're mostly hidden in, in lab books. They might be talked about in the lab or, you know, you go to a conference, you might share that, that knowledge with others in your field, but actually most of those results are hidden. And so it seems actually quite a lot of wasted time and effort. So how do we actually change change that narrative? How do we change the, the dial? You know, all research is important. The, the, the research that, that is not ex necessarily the most exciting research because it actually fills gaps in the knowledge um, as, as you go along. So you need to know those, those um, pieces of information in order to, you know, not waste your time, not repeat things that other people have done before. But, but actually what happens is other labs do repeat that research because the, that results, those results aren't published because they're not eye-catching, impactful research. Next slide, please, Myra. So what we wanted to do is, is really create a collaborative and open pathway for research. We want to capture those messy, inconclusive and incremental steps that make up research. We want to share those negative and null results. We don't want to contrive um, you know, a narrative uh, to fit the experimental result. Um, you know, not all results fit into a, a particular pathway. So it's, you know, you're leaving a, 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 all of those results that don't do that. The most important thing though we feel is that that research should be open. Open should be a driving force because if, if the, the, the research is open, people are able to access it, be, be able to reuse it. And that's why open access, open data, and actually open and signed peer review, we feel is really important because it, it's, it leaves um, that research collaborative and transparent. And this is beginning to be recognized um, in research assessments. You may have heard of DORA, um, which recognizes that hiring, promotion and funding decisions should focus on the qualities of research that are desirable, i.e. insight, impact, reliability and reusability. So there is a changing of the dial in the research culture that is going on. Next slide, please, Myra. 
So this is why um, we created experimental results. Now, experimental results is a gold open access journal, i.e. The, 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 the research that's published is reusable and accessible. Um, it helps towards resolving the reputability crisis because we um, publish uh, results that are important that, that, that validate existing results. Maybe those existing results are, are controversial for some reason or other, or people don't believe them. It's useful to have actually um, reproducibility of, of, of particular results. We accept null, negative, novel results. And these, these results are standalone research findings. So you don't have to do another six, res, uh, six experiments in order to make up a, a, a traditional paper format. The, the research in its set itself, um, you know, as long as it goes through peer review is, is important in itself. We have um, innovative open peer review as standards and we, we felt that that was really important because it's, it's research and, and we want people to, to understand that, that actually we're not judging it in terms of, um, you know, impact. It's, it's been judged in terms of is this is a good experiment? Has it been carried out correctly? Is this statistical um, parts in place? So I'm going to um, hand over now to Ali Paskins, who's publishing editor for Experimental Results. Uh, thanks, Fiona. Um, next slide, Myra, please. OK, so to start with, um, I'm going to talk about experimental results so far. Um, so far, we've appointed 200, more than 200 team members across a range of roles. Um, chief editors, reviewing editors, editorial board, statistical editors and social media editors from more than 40 countries. Um, so it's clear that people across the globe are recognising experimental results as an initiative that they want to be involved in. We've already published 66 papers in the journal, 26, 27 of which are under the life science and biomedicine subject category. And we've seen more than 100 submissions covering all of the eight board subject categories. These numbers demonstrate that the mission of experimental results resonates with many and that it is an attractive publication venue. I've included an example of one of our psychology and psychiatry papers here, um, as this achieved a really great altmetric score of 150. It was picked up by 15 news outlets, two blogs, and it had 33 tweets. So this was, this was really great and really promising. Next slide, thank you. Um, so the next few slides show the team for life science and biomedicine as it currently stands. Um, and we're continually growing the team. And so first of all, there's Michael Nevels, who is chief editor. Um, and Michael will be speaking next. Uh, Michael is responsible for leading the section, uh, directing the scientific quality for this subject area and advising on the journal's direction. Then we have uh, Mariake Wandel, who's the social media editor for the section. She's responsible for working with the other subject social media editors to enhance and grow the journal's Twitter presence, maximizing visibility and engagement. We also have a large number of reviewing editors with a range of expertise. The reviewing editors are responsible for managing the peer review process and making final decisions on the papers. Uh, so the, this slide and the next shows the reviewing editors. So these are some of the subject areas that we that they cover, and you can see that there's a there's a good geographical spread there as well. Then we have the editorial board. The editorial board are responsible for for reviewing papers or recommending contacts to approach for reviews as requested by the reviewing editors. This is our editorial board so far, but we're continuing to expand and we'll be adding more, more members to the team in, in 2021. Next slide, please. And we have a number of statistical editors um, focusing on the life science and biomedical area um, who are listed here. The statistical editors are responsible for assessing the validity of data in manuscripts as requested by the reviewing editors. They evaluate statistical concerns or questions raised by the reviewers and assess, 
aspects such as appropriateness of an, of an analytical approach and whether the inference drawn from a statistical analysis is justified. And then they then advise the reviewing editors who can make a, a, make a final decision based on the comments of the statistical editors and the comments of the reviewers. Um, we've included here a few testimonials that we've received from some of the first authors of the journal. Uh, so first of all, we have Terry Palmer, um, who noted that it's a great avenue to publish results that are important, but not extensive enough for a full journal article, and that we've been able to quickly transform the results of a small study into a citable publication. Then we have Andre Luis Souza dos Santos, who noted that it's a great initiative Negative results are significant approaches, so their divulgation will permit that other groups do not repeat or replicate these experiments. And then we have Punit Shah, who noted that experimental results is a brilliant idea. There's a growing number of journals with transparent review processes, but this one stood out given the priority for short papers reporting on small chunks of data. Um, so I'm next going to talk about open peer review. So as Fiona mentioned, experimental results operates an open peer review process, providing full transparency about decision making to fit with the open culture of the journal. Open peer review helps to mitigate issues that contribute to editorial bias and enables reviewers to collect their contributions as part of their academic record. Authors know who has reviewed their submission with accepted manuscripts being published with their review reports. These reports include the reviewer name, their ORCID ID, and are assigned an individual DOI. Revealing identities of, of authors and reviewers increases transparency, and reviewers can be held accountable for their evaluations. It's been found that this often leads to a higher review in terms of tone and quality, with less instances of reviewer bias as conflicts of interest can be identified by the community. And by publishing the review reports along with the review names and assigning them a DOI, make some citable research outputs, ensuring that the reviewers receive recognition and that they have an up-to-date CV of all areas of their work. Um, so just to look at, um, the review format, which is slightly different to the standard. Um, experimental results aims to have a fast peer review process to ensure that research is published as quickly as possible. To facilitate this, we've set up a scorecard for reviewers to complete, rather than asking for the lengthy review summary that journals traditionally ask for. Experimental results um, requires a minimum of two reviewers per paper. The scorecard asks the reviewer to assess the paper on the quality of the experiment rather than judging the impact of the results. The reviewers need to answer yes to the following three questions in order for the paper to be assessed suitable for publication. Is the experiment reported scientifically sound? Are the controls used valid? And are the experimental methods well designed? The reviewer also answers a series of questions under three sections, presentation, context and analysis, ranking their answers from one poor to five excellent. The questions in each section are weighted according to importance, and this is taken into account for the calculation of the overall section score out of five. And finally, um, looking um, at the community, uh, the fact that it's a journal for the community. So experimental results aims to progress the scientific field forwards, providing the opportunity for all sound experimental research to be published, regardless of how novel or how high impact. We recognize that we are currently in a reproducibility crisis with duplicate research being undertaken globally. And we're hoping that experimental results will play a part in reducing this. We believe that Experimental Results is a journal run by the scientific community for the benefit of the community. The editorial team itself is large and growing, and we recognise that with such a large team, there is risk that members can feel one and many and not heavily involved with the journal itself. 
we are working as much as we can to assure that this isn't the case. All of the team have had the opportunity to receive a promotional materials pack and join both full team and subject group webinars, which have seen lively discussions around how to improve the journal, increase its, vis its visibility, and provide for each broad subject category effectively. We continually welcome feedback from team members on how to improve and enhance the journal, and we implement these recommended changes wherever possible. All team members have also received the bi-monthly newsletter, which gives an update on how the journal is doing and any highlights. We've already made adjustments to ensure that experimental results provide for each of the subject areas it covers, such as having subject-specific instructions for authors where needed. We fully recognise the importance of good reviewers to the, success, to the success of a journal. Editorial board members are expected to review up to five papers a year. In addition to the recognition that reviewers receive through open peer review, we are also offering reviewers discounts on article processing charges for submitted papers. So authors who have carried out a peer review will be able to claim a £150 discount on the APC, up to a maximum of two peer reviews. So for example, a maximum discount of £300. We're also keen for the journal to provide for early career researchers as much as possible, with many being on the team already. We're currently working on setting up initiatives to help early career researchers with reviewing, such as peer review mentoring and peer review and author workshops. So um, next I'm going to pass you on to Michael, who's going to run through the anatomy of a paper and also um, give some background on what the journal means for life science and biomedicine. Great. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Ali. Um, so my name is, is Michael Nevels. I'm a, a reader at the University of St. Andrews in, in Scotland. And um, I'm originally from Germany. And I spent a few years in the United States. And uh, I think six years ago, I, I moved to the UK. And I've been interested in viruses. So I've been studying viruses for over 20 years now. And uh, more, more recently, I became uh, the chief editor for life science and biomedicine for our new journal, uh, Expert Results. And I'm really uh, honored and really delighted, you know, to, to take on this role. Um, I don't, I don't want to be too repetitive, but uh, I thought, you know, by, by looking at the uh, anatomy of a paper that was uh, published in, in Expert Results, we will learn a bit more, you know, about this journal. So um, this is a paper that was published last year as, as one of the very first papers in, in this journal. And it's by a group of, of scientists from Germany and the UK. And one of the authors, the first author, Professor Martin Michaelis, is here with us today and he is going to you know talk about his experiences with the journal um, later on. Um, so this is uh, let's let's start at the top. So excellent results, uh, Cambridge University Press, there's a DOI here, and then the broad subject area here is is biomedical sciences. So um, Expert result has has eight subject areas that you know broadly cover the STEM disciplines, and and this is obviously a, a biomedical sciences paper. The results type is novel here, uh, so this is quite a, a novel finding and an exciting finding, I have to say. Um, I hope I don't give away too much by saying that what the authors found here is is when they're using a drug at a, at a very low concentration that is considered to be ineffective against the target, they still see an effect of this drug um, in terms of the sensitivity, sensitivity of these cells to other drugs, you know, drugs that are subsequently given. So quite exciting. Having said that, um, we're equally happy, you know, to accept manuscripts that are not novel as you know Fiona and, and Ali pointed out 
we're happy to take, you know, negative results, supplementary results, um, and uh, also uh, uh, replicating um, results. And so we think they are equally, you know, valuable. Um, anyway, so uh, what is important here is that uh, we have a word limit of 2000. We're not, you know, meticulous about this, but, you know, word count shouldn't be much uh, above 2000. And um, so these are very short papers. And um, so uh, you have to keep things as concise as possible. Uh, there's an abstract that should be 150 words maximum with, you know, the usual background findings, implications of the work. Um, and then we ask you to provide three to five keywords. And then there's a mandatory introduction, which tends to be short, as you can see here. And on the next slide, um, you see uh, the uh, an optional objective section. So some authors decide to combine this um, part with the introduction, which is fine. Then there has to be a method section, of course. Again, uh, it needs to be short. And a result section, of course. In this case, as you can see, it's very short. Sometimes it's a bit longer, but you know, um, you should keep things uh, really concise. And then there can be a discussion section, uh, a separate one, or you know, you may combine your results with the discussions. And on the next slide, uh, you will see that um, there can be tables, of course. Uh, so we accept uh, four, up to four figures or tables combined. Um, so there should not be more than that. So this paper has a table one. Then on the next slide, you will see a figure, figure one, as you can see, it can be a multi-panel figure. And on the next slide, you will see another table. And then there's a, a mandatory conclusion section. So introduction, methods, results and conclusions are the compulsory sections. Everything else is optional. And then there may be author contributions and there's a required paragraph on uh, your funding. And uh, then um, there's also a required statement on data availability. So sometimes, you know, all the data are within the paper. But if not, you will have to state this here. So sometimes, you know, our omics data are put into, and we actually encourage, of course, you know, we encourage to, to put this data into uh, publicly accessible repositories, but then you have to state this here. And, but there can also be supplementary uh, materials. Um, so anything that is impractical to, you know, be included in, in the paper, in the main uh, paper, such as, for example, extensive data sets or uh, 3D structures of proteins, uh, for example, maybe you have a, a movie about a, maybe a, a live cell imaging piece of, of, of you know, data. Uh, this is something you can put in, in the supplement. And then, of course, the references. There is no limit on the references. They don't count towards the 2,000 words. Uh, but, you know, again, try to keep things concise. So this was the, the part, um, you know, that the authors um, have written. And then there's another part to these papers. I'm really excited about this part. I think that's it's really neat, uh, really, really... Um, clever and, and somewhat unique because, you know, um, the reviews uh, are actually uh, published alongside the paper. So, so each paper comes with, you know, several pages uh, that document the review process. And uh, so we have a, an open peer review as, as um, Ali just, just uh, pointed out. And uh, so here's the name of the reviewing editor, that, that's my name, uh, 
more often this is somebody from a pool of reviewing editors. So the reviewing editor doesn't review, it's the person who sends out papers for review. We're still looking for reviewing editors, so if you're interested to join us uh, or, you know, happy to consider your, your application for reviewing editor, but also, you know, as a member of the editorial board, just, you know, please get in touch with me or with Ali. I'm happy to consider the replication. Um, there's an accept statement here, which highlights again, you know, what, what Ali just said. Um, that the, the article uh, was accepted because it is scientifically sound uh, and, you know, the uh, controls are appropriate and uh, the methodology as well and it's statistically valid. Sometimes we are sending out manuscripts to our statistical editors um, and, um, and this manuscript went through a single round of uh, uh, peer review, uh, sorry, similar round of, of minor revision, which is quite typical for our manuscripts. We don't do major revision. And it passed this, this uh, revision. And, um, and then we have, uh, what else do we have? Um, we have the name of the reviewer here. So it's open peer review. And importantly, so each review has a DOI. Um, and, and this gives the reviewer a record of their review, um, which I think is really nice. And then there's a conflict of interest statement here by the reviewer. And then as you can see, sometimes these reviews, the free text it is really short, um, which expedite, expedites the review process because we're using the scoring card that, that Ali already mentioned. Um, so as you can see here, the uh, reviewers, they will um, get these questions here in, in three categories, presentation, context, and analysis, and then they will score these questions out of five. And the scores are weighted, and this results in the total score for each category. So this really helps the, the review process, I think. And so the first reviewer came up with their scores here, and then on the next slide, you'll see what the second reviewer did. So um, he had a lot more free text comments. You can, uh, you know, write a lot, but you don't have to. And again, this is the scorecard. So this reviewer came up with even better scores. And then this manuscript was reviewed by a third person. On the next slide. Um, so um, there are at least two reviewers for each manuscript. Sometimes we have more. And so again, this reviewer had a few comments here and then, you know, came up with um, scores as well. And after, you know, the revision, three reviewers endorsed publication, and I did. And so the paper was quickly published. And, um, can I have the next slide, please, Myra? Um, so to, to um, you know, to uh, wrap this up, my part, before handing over to, to Martin, um, I just wanted to, um, I just wanted to briefly say what I, what I usually, you know, tell people who ask me why they should publish in, in this, this journal, Experiment Results. I mean, we all know there are so many journals out there and, um, you know, with a new journal, there's always a degree of uncertainty, of course. So what I tell them is um, that this is a, a unique journal. We publish short reports. We don't just publish novel and positive results, exciting results. We do that as well. But, you know, we're also happy to publish negative results, replicating results, supplementary results. Results that don't fit in other journals, um, maybe small studies. So maybe maybe you have a student in the lab. So in St. Andrews, we usually have a lot of good students. Sometimes 
We have these master students in biochemistry who spend a year with us in the lab. And after some initial training, they usually, many of them come up with, with really nice, good quality results. But because, you know, they only have limited time, it's not a lot of data. And then, uh, you know, uh, you save the data down to, to a hard drive and then um, you may dig it out again at some point in the future, or maybe not. So um, I have a lot of stuff saved down to my hard drives that I, you know, imagine I would combine with more data in the future and then, you know, get a full length paper out. Uh, but now, you know, there's this opportunity that you can uh, publish these, these small chunks of of results in experimental results um, and uh, you know from a student project or um, you know something that didn't make it into a, a traditional paper and um, you can do this quickly because obviously you will have to spend less time on the writing you only have to write 2,000 words and uh, have one to four figures of tables Turnaround times are short, at least we aim at short turnaround times. Initially, there were some delays, but now these uh, turnaround times uh, get much shorter. And your paper will be, you know, very quickly either accepted or, you know, it will go through a minor revision, a single round, not multiple rounds. There is no major revision. So um, if we believe the paper is not suitable and cannot be, you know, modified just by making changes to the text and figures, then we will reject it. And some of the reject papers are re-invited for, you know, a resubmission. And uh, so even though we aim at quick turnaround time, the papers are short, we don't actually compromise on the quality of the papers. So uh, every paper will be fully peer-reviewed, open peer-reviewed by at least two experts. Cambridge University Press is a very reputable publisher with hundreds of years of experience. They publish 10,000s of, of items every year. So a lot of experience there, very renowned publisher. And you know, once your paper is accepted, uh, everybody around the world with internet access will be able to assess your paper with no restrictions, no fees, no paywall whatsoever. And if we think that, um, that, you know, um, given these benefits, um, it is really affordable to publish in expert results. We charge several 50 pounds per paper right now, but we offer discounts to reviewers. So if you reviewed papers for expert results, you can claim up to 300 pounds, which will bring down your, your fees substantially. There are also institutional access funds not everywhere, but you can check with your institution. So St. Andrews, for example, currently offers uh, to cover fees for gold open access publishing. And then we also have waivers, fee waivers for eligible countries. Um, and uh, so if you're from a low or middle income country, you can, you can claim these waivers. And this is to actually, you know, to involve people from um, developing countries um, which are, you know, usually these 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 um, people are underrepresented in the in the scientific literature. And you know, some, sometimes in resource poor settings, you cannot generate like huge amounts of data, but you know, maybe small sets of good quality data, and these are also worth publishing. Um, and I think that's me for now, and I'm, I'm happy to hand over to to uh, Professor uh, Martin. Michele is now, he's a, he's a very, very prolific author, one of the most prolific persons I've ever met. And he already contributed several papers to expert results and he's going to tell us a bit, uh, you know, about his experience with the journal. Thanks. Hello, thank you very much. Um, yeah, so obviously now it's my turn. Don't have that much time left, I have to say, to my the speakers before me. Um, yeah, my role is to tell you why why we published a paper there. 
And I think I have to say a few words about the paper and its findings. So what we do here, one of the things we do is actually we are interested in acquired drug resistance in cancer. We take cancer cell lines, adapt them to anti-cancer drugs. We, we try to do this in a systematic way. So we have established a collection, what we call the resistant cancer cell line collection, the RCCL collection. And there we have about two and a half thousand drug adapted cancer cell lines. That's I think the biggest resource of this kind in the world. So, so we are interested in what happens when a cancer cell becomes resistant to a drug, with the idea being to understand what, 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 what are the processes, and then obviously how can we use them therapeutically. So the simplest thing is to have a biomarker, have a biomarker that tells us, oh, this drug stops working, we have to change the therapy, because then anti-cancer drugs, you know that, are toxic. Uh, you want to spare this drug, you don't want to use it anymore, you don't want to torture a patient with a drug that is not effective anyway. But then ideally also have an alternative, have a biomarker for a next line drug that is then effective again. Now in this area we have worked for uh, quite a long time on NDM2 inhibitors. NDM2 is one of the endogenous inhibitors, probably the most important endogenous inhibitor of P53. P53 is called the guardian of the genome. Um, if there's damage to a cell, if there's DNA damage, um, it causes cell death or damage repair. So, so if it's activated, usually P53 is in the cytosol. If it becomes activated, uh, it goes into the nucleus. It induces the expression of many of its target genes. And then that results in cancer cells normally in apoptosis. Now, um, NDM2, as I said, is the inhibitor. It is one of the uh, in, uh, target genes. It is, uh, it, its expression is induced when P53 becomes a, a transcription factor. Uh, uh, it, it binds to P53 physically, keeps it in the cytosol, and induces its proteasomal degradation. So many anti-cancer drugs cause DNA damage, activate P53, and that contributes to the anti-cancer action. Now, but you don't want to have DNA damage. So people thought if we can interfere with this interaction between MDM2 and P53, we can activate P53 without this DNA damage. Um, and that works sometimes. And, and, and we have worked on the resistance to these MDM2 inhibitors for a long time. We've shown, oh, but then you get P53 mutations. And since then, ever that's now, now 10 years, almost 10 years ago. And since then, we're trying to find out where these P53 mutations come from. And this is now where we come to this paper. Now here we have a cell line that has wild type P53, but it's not sensitive to MDM2 inhibitors. So we thought there are two possibilities how the, where the P53 mutations come from. Either we have a selection pressure and you have occasionally you have a random by chance a P53 mutation and this is where these cells with P53 mutations come from when we adapt them to an MDM2 inhibitor. Alternatively, could have been that uh, it could be that MDM2 inhibitors do something else that actually active, actively favors, promotes P53 mutation. So we thought if we take a cell line that is not sensitive, we take a non-effective uh, uh, drug concentration of MDM2 inhibitor, we treat these cells for a year with this MDM2 inhibitor, we will see whether they are P53 mutations or not in the absence of a selection pressure. And there weren't any. So that's the boring part of the story, or maybe not, maybe that's interesting. I'm not 100% sure. But then we did, since we had these cells, we did something completely different. We tested these cell lines that we had that we had treated for years, we had 10 of them treated for a year with an ineffective drug for the sensitivity to other drugs. And you can, you can forget everything I've told you before, it's just the introduction. That is the important thing and I think that's, that's the main message. And now suddenly, suddenly these cell lines have changed their sensitivity to other drugs, to other drugs that you would normally use to treat these cancer cells. Yeah, they're acute myeloid leukemia cells, other drugs that you would use to treat acute myeloid leukemia. And that's quite extraordinary because it tells us, in my opinion, you can disagree. I'm always happy to discuss this if anybody has an idea. This tells us that every treatment 
has an effect on the cancer cells. So we really have to understand that much, much, much better. If you have a cancer patient, you treat them with the first time therapy, there is no response. You don't see anything. There's no response. It may still decide what the next line therapy does, whether the patient will or will not respond to the next line therapy. And that is a new finding, a new idea. I've never seen that anymore. And obviously I wouldn't have had this thought if we hadn't done this experiment. So, so that is why we are, why we were very keen to get the message out there. Yeah, so we have to look much more in depth what our therapies do, because they can affect even a, a, an apparently non-effective first-line therapy influences the following steps. Um, the problem with that, and this is now really the story why experimental research, the problem with that is uh, uh, where do you go with such a finding? Yeah, you can raise, you can, you can, you can invest another four or five years to make a big paper out of it that people may or may not find interesting. Um, but these four or five years are lost. Many people are working on cancer therapies right now. Yeah, so, so this is a valid finding. We have that. So, so, so we thought, but we want to get this out. And another experience is you talk to people about that and they're very excited. They think, oh, that's, that's interesting. Oh, where can I read that? Now you think, yeah, obviously you want to get this finding, although it's just an isolated finding, you don't really know what the next steps would be. You say, think, oh, we have to get this out there. We have to show it to the people who might be interested. Now you can put everything into a preprint, but a preprint is always a difficult one. It's not peer reviewed, it's not. It is more convincing to people if you have published in a peer reviewed journal by a decent publisher. And so, and obviously I was aware because you heard that I'm a reviewing editor of this journal. So I was aware of this journal. So these things came neatly, very nicely together. Um, uh, there was this new journal. I thought it was a very good idea. It was a very good idea to give research a platform that normally might not be published. Um, the drawers of this world, uh, of the researchers in this world are full of unpublished data that nobody else sees, that nobody can learn anything from it, where people do probably do the same experiments again and again and again without having the desired outcome because they don't know that, anybody, that other people have done that before. Yeah, on top of that now we have this thing we want to shout to the world. That is interesting. You really want to look at that um, um, and we don't have a huge paper, a short format, actually I like short formats anyway, um, and it was an opportunity for us to get this out in a decent peer-reviewed journal. And then it makes a difference when you are giving a lecture somewhere, when you're invited, when you go to a conference, when you can show people actually the data, when everybody can go to the paper and can look what what the people have done, what we have done in this case. And I think that's the big strength of experimental research. It is a platform that enables you to um, publish um, um, findings that are normally not accepted by journals as a full paper. And I think that is what I have to say about my motivation as author to publish this paper in experimental research. Thank you, Martin. And thank you to all our speakers. It was great hearing from all your different perspectives. I hope you enjoyed hearing from our panelists. So if you have any questions, please pop them in the chat box as we move on to our Q&A. Um, yeah, we'd like to invite you to submit your questions into the chat box they'll come to us and we can pass them on to our panelists and that they can answer them. And from there we can have a discussion. So yes, I'll give you a few minutes to submit your questions. And while we wait, we do have some pre-submitted questions sent um, that I'm able to ask our panelists. Um, some of these um, will cover maybe perhaps what you're already thinking. Um, so I'll just go ahead and start. Okay, so. Uh, Fiona, I have a question for you. Um, 
Have you considered implementing post-publication review? Um, we, we did actually, we have experimented with this um, on a, a number of our titles um, and it's where um, authors are able to, or not just authors, just readers are able to add comments to a, an already published paper. Um, we found um, that actually um, a sort of mixed economy really, there was an awful lot of comments that were kind of um, correcting people's uh, language, correcting their, um, their spellings, you know, it wasn't necessarily working out as we had imagined it to be. I think we're going to um, spend some more time looking at how useful and valuable that, that is. And of course, we would rule out if we did think it was worth it. But I think we, we have to do a bit more user testing. Perfect. Thank you so much, Fiona. Um, I have the question in the chat box, actually. Um, an attendee is asked how to know that the review of my experimental results is perfect and has good results. So perhaps I can hand that to you, Ali, if you don't mind answering. I wonder whether this is something that might be better suited to Michael or Fiona. Would one of you be happy to pick this up? Uh, I can. I can try. Um, Amira, could you could you please repeat the question? Yeah, of course. Um, so how to know that the review of my experiment's result is perfect and has good results um, to submit, I guess. That the review is perfect? And um, I'm not sure if I understand the question. Um, um, so is it, is it uh, I wonder whether they're perhaps asking whether whether they're happy with the reviews and whether they want to question what the reviewer was saying, perhaps. Um, and if that's the case, then yes, obviously do, you know, that's absolutely fine to, 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 to reach back and, and question anything you're unsure or not or not sure you agree with with what a reviewer is saying. Um, if, if that is the question. Perfect. Thank you, Ali. Um, I have another question from Amina, if I'm pronouncing that correct. Um, and the question is how to write the experimental result in a unique form and in an, in an accurate manner, I'm guessing. Um, Ali, would you like to answer this one on, I guess, just short... Possibly also one from Michael, but Feel free to pass it back if you're not sure, Michael. Oh, sorry. Um, is this about the format of the paper? So there are uh, clear guidelines about the format of the paper um, online. Um, you know, as with all journals, uh, there's a guide to authors, and uh, you can look up the requirements. I mean, I've I've, I've gone to the anatomy of a paper, and you know. Um, this is, you know, basically what, what is required in terms of the uh, format. And you can obviously go online on the, onto the website and look at look at other papers that have already published and, and get a feel there as well. Thank you, Ali. Maybe um, say a few words as author, because actually that's quite straightforward. It's, it's like every other paper, basically, that you would normally submit. It's just shorter, yeah? The only thing is really... It is much shorter. It's a bit of a change because you have to think slightly differently about what you put in and how you put it in. But in the end, once you have, once you get used to it, it's, I actually found it very convenient because you don't have to fill any space. Also, you rather narrow it down. Usually, the narrative becomes much clearer because it's much more focused than than a longer paper. Thank you. I have one question for you, Martin. Um, a pre-submitted question which is, have you considered the open peer review process before you decided to submit to experimental results? Not really, actually. Obviously, I was aware of it, but I haven't spent much thought about it. Obviously, people have said that to me, that, oh, is it, and what do you, do, 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 are you not worried that forever you have the paper and next to it, you have forever nasty comments by a reviewer who didn't really like your paper? And, 
I think, oh, actually, no, that's not a problem, right? Every scientific article is the contribution to an ongoing scientific discussion and everybody can have their own opinion on things and I may see things differently. I'd rather get my things published and have nasty comments on the side than not getting it published. Yeah, because that's it's just in the end down to these things. It's not, it's also I think we shouldn't be overly worried about uh, about the judgment of others too much because in the end as a researcher you have to be confident about what you're doing and everybody brings their own background expertise to the table everybody has a slightly different uh, uh, opinion but I, I think actually it's a very good thing and and these peer reviews also can and put your research very much in in context okay so you can probably learn much more often in the peer review process there's much more um in the background in the process that never gets across in the final paper and often that's lost and it can be interesting discussions so so actually i quite i i will have always been positive from the very beginning about that can, can i just add actually i think the really useful thing about it um you know for for the reviewer themselves is that they can actually um collect those reviews as part of their academic record so it becomes really valuable of what they do and they can show that to to you know committees at their own university to show the the kind of contribution that they they're making to their research field thank you fiona um i'm quite aware that we are approaching the end of the webinar um so i hope those pre-submitted questions have covered a broad range of questions of um and answered anything you might have thought. Um, any questions left in the chat box, we will be able to answer and follow up in our email to you. So that brings us to the end of our webinar today. I really hope you have all enjoyed it and found it useful to the discussion, discussion hearing from different perspectives, from publisher to editor and to author. I'd really like to thank our panelists, Fiona, Ali, Martin and Michael today for taking part. As mentioned earlier, you will have an email in the next couple of days with the recording and the slides that you're able to watch back, as well as a short survey about the usefulness of today's webinar. You'll notice on the slides of our panellists have included their contact details as well, should you want to reach out and discuss anything further about experimental results or the life science and biomedical field. Thank you for attending.